Now you can't really imagine the Florida Everglades lades without the alligator, and you can't really imagine the ocean side without the seagull. And this is the role that the prairie chicken used to have on the Iowa landscape, is that uh, there's many accounts of our early settlers who woke up in the morning to the call of the prairie chicken, not the crow or the rooster. Uh, it's something that we've lost. So I, I would like to introduce you to the prairie chicken. Uh, you can tell he looks a little bit like a domestic chicken, uh, with, but with brown striping. Uh, what distinguishes this is be the orange eyebrows, which are personally my favorite feature of the prairie chicken, because I don't know another animal that is outrageous enough to walk around with orange eyebrows. Uh, they also have uh, sacks on the side of the neck, which are featherless and bright orange, and they inflate while the males are uh, doing a mating display and trying to attract mates. Uh, so this is what sets them apart. It's, yes, it's a chicken, which is a rather boring animal to most people. Uh, physically, they're a little bit different. So we have them weighing about two to three pounds and maybe about a foot and a half long. Just to get an idea, in case you haven't been fortunate enough to see one yet in the wild or in a zoo, uh, this, is about, this is the animal we're working with. There he is again. Uh, so the, the prairie chickens, as I said, have been here for a very long time. Uh, and when settlers arrived, they became a really popular food item. Uh, most things titled chicken are very popular food items. Uh, and this was no difference. I found it interesting that this was actually one of Mark Twain's favorite foods. And being from Missouri, uh, as was the prairie chicken, they were very common there also. Uh, so they very quickly became a popular item for food and game. Uh, and with the landscape at the time, they did very well. It was broken up. We had some pasture land. We had some agriculture. Uh, we had a, a still a lot of open grassland. And this mosaic of land was very, very good for prairie chickens. As we'll go into, uh, they require very, uh, various types of habitat to survive. And so at this time, it was perfect. Uh, so really, they had their peak in 1870s, 1880s. Uh, in a popular book, uh, Land So Full of Game, uh, there's a uh, an account recorded from 1984. Um, and let me get the number right. There was a line of flying prairie chickens a mile long, 50 yards wide, and the group was estimated to be 33,000, right, just flying through. Um, and they'll fly about 30 miles if they need to, to find appropriate habitat. So if you can imagine a mile long group of about 33,000 birds flying through, uh, that's how populous they were at that time. But unfortunately, they went through a decline. Uh, and this began later in the uh, 1800s. And there were two things that really contributed to that decline. First, we had modern agriculture. We got much better at farming. And as we did this, we utilized more and more and more grassland uh, for agriculture. And when this happened, it really broke down the diversity of that landscape. A recurring theme with prairie chickens is that we really need diversity. We need a diversity of habitat to support them. And without that, uh, they didn't have the correct breeding grounds and, and brood raising grounds that they were going to need. The other thing was hunting. As I already mentioned, they're popular for food. And if we don't manage that source properly, we're going to eat it out of existence, which is exactly what we did. Uh, the first laws restricting a harvest on prairie chickens uh, came a little bit too late in the 1850s. Um, they weren't able to be in enforced properly, and they weren't really strong enough. So prairie chick chickens already did not have the protection they needed. Now, by the turn of the last century, they were becoming a rare sight. Uh, so by 1917, we said, OK, no more hunting on prairie chickens. We need to protect this population. But again, at that time, it was a hard law to enforce. Uh, there really wasn't enough uh, power behind it. So uh, unfortunately, we came down to two counties where we still had prairie chickens, Wayne and Appanoose County down in southern central Iowa. Uh, and they were the last places we had them. Um, and as they faded out of existence almost uh, without notice, uh, suddenly they're less and less and less, and then they're gone. Uh, so our last breeding pair was observed in 1955 in Appanoose County, and then they were gone for the next 33 years. And we had lost this extremely iconic figure on our landscape. Uh, we're not in Kansas anymore, so this is referring to the chickens that we were able to translocate from Kansas. Um, Excuse me. OK, so the first attempt we made was in the 1980s. We've decided, just like you, you can't see the Everglades without an alligator, and you don't want to picture the, picture the seashore without a seagull, uh, we decided these are an important feature on our landscape, and they should be reintroduced. 
So the first attempt was made in the early 80s. Uh, we brought 100 just over 100 birds to the Lust Hills, which seemed like a good choice at the time. The Lust Hills is a very protected area. It's a very unique geographic area to Iowa, so we do have a lot of original habitat remaining, and it seemed like a, a good spot to put them. Uh, unfortunately, by 1984, it seemed that that uh, population had extirpated. Uh, I imagine most of us are familiar with extirpated, uh, but just to clarify, this would be a population that has become locally extinct. So they're still found in other places, but no longer in Iowa. Uh, so our second attempt was then in the later 80s. Okay, that didn't work. What was wrong? Well, probably the habitat was wrong. So in the later 80s, we released 254 birds to the Ringgold Wildlife Area down in Ringgold County, and most decided they'd rather live in Missouri. Well, fine. Uh, so most of those ended up in Missouri. Uh, so our third attempt, well, we're not giving up on them yet. This is an important bird, and we've almost got it. So the third attempt came in the early 90s uh, with the release of 304 birds. So we're more and more and more birds as the year goes, goes on. Uh, released at Kellerton Wildlife Area. Now this population found a nice home at Kellerton, said, okay, we're gonna stay here and we're gonna uh, repopulate, we're gonna be all right here in Kellerton. Uh, so for years, this seemed to be a, a very good exercise and successful. And so here's a map showing where these birds uh, were introduced to. You see this one up here, uh, that would be over in the Lus Hills, our first introduction that didn't really take. Um, in five, we had a, a population that didn't really take that we tried in 93 and 94, and that didn't work out very well. Uh, so this two, three, and four down in Ringgold County is really where we found the best habitat for the birds. All right, so I keep saying these birds are important, but the underlying question is why are they so important? Yes, they're iconic, and yes, they uh, have a certain uh, nostalgia for uh, the way that our landscape used to look, but coming from a science perspective, why is this such an important species? And it's because of this term. They are an umbrella species. So this is a term that we use in conservation biology and uh, in a basic sense, it's a wide ranging species whose needs include those of many other species. Uh, so it falls under this category like the grizzly bear in British Columbia, or uh, you can consider the uh, checker spot, uh, Baltimore, I believe, a butterfly in California, where you have a species that requires a certain type of habitat and that other species are going to benefit from the protection of that habitat. Uh, again, species with large area requirements uh, for which protection of the species offers protection to other species sharing that same habitat. Uh, and a lot of times this is applied to a large mammal or something. Um, but here we can think about the prairie chicken because they have huge habitat requirements. And as I've already mentioned, they need a variety of habitat. So a lot of species will end up falling under that umbrella of protection. Uh, we also call this a keystone or a flagship species, once again uh, emphasizing their importance. So how does this work with the prairie chicken? As I said, this is normally, I guess the majority of the time, it's something that we think of a large, uh, very noticeable animal. Uh, well, there's a variety of grassland birds that are going to benefit uh, from the prairie chicken. And this is just a small smattering. So we have our birds of prey, like up, let's see, here we have our northern harrier and our short-eared owl that depend on these grasslands uh, for hunting grounds. Um, uh, let's see, the Henslow sparrow, the bobolink. Uh, wait, Henslow sparrow. So we have a variety that are going to depend on the prairie chicken. So I keep saying, all right, they have all these habitat requirements. Really, how demanding are these requirements? Well, they need about 4,000 acres which is great for those birds of prey, like the short-eared owl and the northern harrier, who also need a wide habitat in which to hunt. They need a lek. Now, a lek is uh, a ground that's a bit higher uh, on the landscape and a bit shorter grass, so that way when they're out doing their dance and their display, they've got a nice spot for the ladies to, to check out the males as they're out there strutting their stuff. Uh, so they need this lek for that area. And uh, uh, birds like the upland sandpiper, they're in the middle, for example, uh, also need that type of area. Now for nesting, now we need an even different type of habitat, uh, a tall grass habitat uh, that has a lot of good cover because they do uh, nest on the ground. So you need good uh, cover for that. It's somewhere near the lek. Um, birds like the bobolink are going to take advantage of that. And then 
once you've had your brood and you're trying to take care of your brood, uh, adjacent to that nest habitat, you need some um, dense flowering grass type uh, habitat, uh, which again is going to be beneficial to more and more species. Now, if that wasn't enough, if these weren't high maintenance animals enough, to make it through the winter, they need some woody shrubs and some more protect protection than you would find with just a grassy area, uh, which is going to be beneficial, again, to more species. So the diversity of all the different habitats that they need is going to end up covering a lot of different species of grassland birds. Um, so here's some of our common grassland, mostly common grassland birds from Iowa. You see down here the killdeer is going to require um, sparse grass, very short grass, up till you get to the sage wren, which needs very dense, very tall grass. And all these birds are covered under the protection of the prairie chicken. So the case is getting a little bit stronger. To make it even more stronger, <laughs> or more strong, uh, in the Kellerton Bird Conservation Area, we find every single grassland bird that is found in the state of Iowa is found in Kellerton Bird Conservation Area. Uh, this is extremely important because grassland birds are one of our quickest birds on the decline. About 54% of grassland birds in the Midwest are in serious decline. In Iowa, it could be as high as 57%. Uh, so to have this area that falls under the protection of the prairie chicken for a, a wide multitude of species um, really strengthens the case behind the prairie chicken. Uh, one of the most interesting cases here would be the Henslow sparrow, uh, which is so down here, and uh, it's sort of a nondescript small brown bird, which, uh, you know, for being a wildlife specialist, they're all important. They all have a very special ecological role. Uh, but really, as people, we're biased. And we like things that are a little bit larger or colorful, have interesting behavior, are charismatic in some way. Those are the ones we want to protect. That's why the uh, WWF is represented by a panda and not a trout, right? <laughs> Uh, so would this tiny little brown bird get the same consideration for protection as a large, colorful, dancing, singing bird? Well, probably not. So are prairie chickens an umbrella species? This is a tricky term. Uh, we would consider them yes because they do fall, uh, there's so many animals that are protected on the habitat that we have protected for them. Uh, but it is a tricky situation uh, as far as just classification and terminology. So I, I've been mentioning this bird conservation area, and Kellerton is one of our ecological treasures, I would think, in Iowa. It was the first in the nation to be designated as a grassland bird conservation area. Now, grasslands are the least protected habitat of any uh, in North America. Can anybody take a guess on why? Let me snap in teacher mode. Hmm? because you can farm it, right? If we can make food out of this, we're not going to offer it as much protection as somewhere else, exactly. Um, so we have a, uh, it was our first in the nation grassland uh, bird conservation area, uh, which was a big step. And also we have a nice uh, viewing platform there that was donated by the Iowa Ornitho Ornithological Union. Uh, so you can go and, and stay on this platform and use the spotting scope to look out further and see things in a little more detail. Uh, so it's a really nice place to, um, see a variety of grassland species, uh, birds and otherwise. Uh, so we monitor this area in a couple of different ways. Uh, one would be tree clearing. How this, uh, there's a lot of people this doesn't jive very well with because we know trees as being very important. And in our, our global ecosystem, yes, trees are very, very important. Uh, but on a grassland, they get in the way. They, provide, they take nutrients up from the ground and don't provide as many for grasses. Uh, they cast a wide shadow. Uh, they break up the landscape, which the prairie chickens really hate. They don't like to nest anywhere near a power line, much less a tree. Uh, so one of the things we do is to take down invasive trees and invasive shrubs and other woody structures uh, to really keep that grassland rolling and open. Uh, we make sure that the land is protected. Uh, since the, uh, the inauguration of this area, we've bought up about 760 acres. And then in the nearby Ringgold Wildlife Area, another 587 acres. So we have over 1,300 acres have been added, which leaves us with over 4,000 in protection, which the prairie chicken needs, 4,000. So that works out well for us. One of the ways we've been able to do this is by forming a partnership uh, called the Grand River Grasslands. So this stretches from Iowa uh, down into Missouri. So this is a 
uh, a partnership between the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and the Missouri Department of Conservation and also the Nature Conservancy. So we've had a lot of groups get interested in this project. Uh, in total, that leaves us with over 71,000 acres. Now you're going, okay, chickens, okay, you said that they fly, but really how far they fly? Well, about 30 miles um, that, we, that we know of. Um, hopefully we will be able to track that a little bit closer within the coming years, and we'll see. Uh, so anywhere within this area is certainly not out of reach over a scope of years for the prairie chickens to move back and forth and find the habitat that's best for them. Uh, another note, something that we use to, to improve this land would be uh, uh, a technique called patch burn grazing. So in patch burn grazing, we're going to burn part of this grassland. Uh, cattle that are on it are naturally going to gravitate towards that area and really eat up a lot of the grasses and keep those flowering forbs and keep the wildflowers. And that's going to add to the diversity of the landscape, which I keep saying that word because it's so important. Um, so with patch burn grazing, we're naturally encouraging cattle to select for grasses that we don't want too much of, so that way we allow wildflowers and other forbs to thrive. So this is a very natural way of doing that rather than spraying a pesticide or an insecticide or uh, herbicide. There we go, herbicide. Uh, so if I've swayed you to say, okay, I really want to go down to Kellerton and check this area out, uh, I want to invite you to our Prairie Chicken Festival, which will be on April 7th. Um, last year, we had about, in, in late March, we had over 460 cars drive through with an average of about three and a half people per vehicle. Uh, so a lot of people came down to visit this. Um, now, just as we're biased towards really large, colorful, charismatic animals, we also like to see things with dollars and cents behind them. It's, it's great to say that everything has intrinsic value, but really you need to get down to the bottom line. Uh, so when these people came through, uh, they spent an average of $2,523 on food, $3,457 on lodging, $1,427,000 on shopping, and $2,000 on transportation. So you're talking about, about $9,500 in total being brought in by these birds. For Ringgold County, that is certainly not our most affluent county in the state. And uh, this ecotourism can be a big boon. Uh, so we have people coming in from all over Iowa. Here's a graph showing all the locations they came from, uh, with some from Missouri and some from Minnesota uh, coming in. And, and hopefully we'll be drawing more and more people in. Uh, now I should mention, over the past couple years, we've had an average of about 20 birds on the lek. So that's a pretty small amount of birds to be attracting this many people. As I'll go on to detail, we'll be bringing in more uh, next week. So having more birds can hopefully make these numbers even higher and get more people into the area. So as I just mentioned, the past two years, we've had about 20 birds uh, monitored on the leks. We see about 25 of those over winter. So conservatively, we estimate there might be between 25, possibly as high as 40, somewhere in the area that we're not seeing. Uh, down in Dunn Ranch in Missouri, they found lower numbers than that. Uh, so here's our, uh, something we've been able to do with the help of Blank Park Zoo especially, is to create some habitat models to show where's actually the best habitat for this bird and are we utilizing that habitat. So you see in red, that would be our best, our most suitable habitat. And let's look back at where we found the birds. That matches it pretty closely. So something that we've been able to accomplish where we, we had, uh, did not find success in the 80s and late 80s and maybe even to the early 90s was are we really using the best habitat for these birds? Are we really managing that habitat in the best way for these birds? So now we're a little more confident that with the tools we've been able to use and the help that we've gotten from Blank Park Zoo that we can really find the habitat that these birds need to survive. Now there's another issue and that would be genetic testing. That's something that we have started and that we will be continuing. Uh, well, are genetics an issue? It's uh, common sense that we don't really like to inbreed. We don't like a lot of inbreeding. Just as having a diverse landscape is important, having a diverse uh, genetic population is also very important. Make sure you don't have that inbreeding, which is going to make the birds sick and uh, more susceptible to predation and things like that. What we found is that uh, these birds are not very genetically diverse. Um, almost 
as un undiverse as the heath hen, which was a close relative who uh, unfortunately has already gone extinct. So we recognize this as being a problem and uh, trying to find solutions for that. Now, how do we get more genes? How do we get a wider gene pool uh, into Kellerton? So what are we doing right now for this issue? Um, well, our partnership with Blank Park Zoo has been completely uh, uh, invaluable. It's been um, something that's helped us create uh, uh, land maps that we can be more confident in, helped us get more staff that we need and we're unable to hire as a government agency, uh, and has uh, also just helped us get a lot more PR. There's a lot more people who come through the zoo and trust the name of the zoo than there's a lot of people who aren't really sure they want to put a lot of confidence <laughs> in the DNR for political reasons, which, uh, well, all right. Um, but the zoo has given us great exposure to this also. So by pledging uh, a certain amount of money for about three years, uh, we've been able to fund this project. And we've been able to fund the first step, which would be the habitat assessment. And I showed you some of our habitat maps that we've come up with, uh, that Grand River grasslands. The second step, which as I said, we were starting on Monday, <laughs> would be to bring more chickens into the Gra Grand River grassland. So our goal for this year, and this is a bit of a pilot study, so we're going to try our techniques out this year, make sure that this is going to work, it's the best thing for the birds, it's the best thing for the population, and then hopefully continue that over the next few years. Uh, this year we're planning to bring about 50, hopefully half male, half female, we'll see uh, who shows up and who we can get. And we'll be bringing those from about south central Nebraska, uh, and to compare our population with their population, uh, we have had no problem um, creating a memorandum of understanding with the state of Nebraska to just take 50 chickens off uh, one private landowner's property. Uh, so you consider there's that many chickens that they are willing just, all right, that's fine, help yourselves. Uh, that's a population we would really like to see in Iowa and get these back to a survivable level. The mission of the Blank Park Zoo okay. is to inspire an appreciation of the natural world. I believe most people have seen this video, actually. Um, and, but what I did want to show, because my uh, sound did not work that properly. If I can make this. The mission of the Blank Park Zoo actually, is okay. to inspire an appreciation of the natural world will be the prairie chickens doing their dance. Here we go. You see those neck sacks inflating? All right, he's running and, uh, oh, there's a female. So you see the females don't have that coloration. They're much more bland. And it doesn't look like anyone's taking the bait, but nice try. So here you see a nice example of how they do like to be up a little bit higher. It looks like he's on top of some hay there or something. What, one trouble that um, we're not sure if we'll have with the, uh, the traps that we'll be using um, to humanely get the prairie chickens into the trap and, and then transport them, uh, we're a little bit afraid that the males, since they are in prime form this time of year, will jump on top of the trap and use it to display, which is not exactly what we're intending. So uh, we'll see what, what happens there. Uh, so again, here's more of our habitat model. Uh, our core habitat would be about 1,700 acres down in Kellerton Wildlife Area. Um, about a third of that's going to be um, of the highest um, uh, suitability, um, but there's plenty that's going to be usable. And then for rearing their young, uh, once again, we see about a third of it being very, very uh, suitable, and the rest should be usable, and this should be fine as long as we manage it and, and keep it in a good quality. So the take home message from this presentation, uh, if you aren't already convinced uh, the prairie chickens are a, a fantastic species, an iconic species of the Iowan landscape, and something that really provides a lot of protection to our grasslands and our grassland species, uh, well, they're just some really cool birds. Uh, they've got some really unique behaviors, some really unique features, uh, but it's not just about them. Uh, I think something that we see expressed from people who visit Kellerton and see the prairie chickens booming and see their behavior is that they feel like we've lost something by not having these statewide anymore. It's, it's a part of our state that we've really lost. So to close on a nice quote, 
um, I finally realized that until then my life had been incomplete and that henceforth all springs must be celebrated at least once in the company and presence of the prairie grouse, which is also the prairie chicken. Uh, so with that thought to tie things together, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. And thank you very much for coming and listening to the talk. Appreciate it. Thank you.